G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Footsteps of the Messiah. This is a study of the last days, and I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Thank you for coming along to this session. We're up to session 24, and we're going to get straight into it. Okay, so we're in, we finished off last session with the millennial Israel. We're now into um, millennial, the millennial Jerusalem. And uh, we're looking, uh, this will be basically covered in Ezekiel 48, chap, Ezekiel 48, verses 30 to 35. He gives a very short description as he closes off his book. Uh, uh, he gives us the details, which nobody else talks about, actually, in regard to um, millennial Jerusalem. Now, all four sides of this well, we, we did a bit of this last session. All four sides of this city are described, along with the gates and their names. The city gates will all be named after the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, the city is 10 miles square. That, that's, that it means each side is 10 miles. It's a square, 10 miles square. Uh, on the north side, we have the three gates. We have Reuben, Judah, and Levi. And that's verse 31 of, uh, of Ezekiel 48. Eastern side, we have the gates of Joseph, Benjamin, and Dan. Southern gates, Simeon, Issachar, and Zebulun. Uh, and the last, the western side, the gates there are Gad, Asher, and Naphtali. So the total measurement of this city will be 10 miles square. 10 miles is uh, about 16 kilometers square. Pretty big. Now, this is just another... Remember last session, we said that the, the, the Millennial River came out of the temple compound. It flowed, first of all, it went, it went, uh, it went north and it come, went east, came down, comes down through the city of Jerusalem and it splits up into watering the, the gardens either side of the city. And it also went from there through the city down into the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. So that's just a, a schematic showing you you know, roughly where the rivers the rivers can flow. We don't know for sure, but something like that. Now, Ezek uh, back to Ezekiel uh, 48. And we're looking now, Jerusalem's name is going to be changed. It's going to be changed to Jehovah Shema, which means Jehovah is there. What, why is that so? Well, because Messiah is going to be there. The, the Messianic God, man, uh, will personally reign from this city. That, that's Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Um, and this city will not only fulfill its name of Jerusalem, the city of peace, but also Jehovah Shema, Jehovah is there because Messiah will rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem on David's throne. And for this same reason, the city will also be called Jehovah our righteousness or, or Jehovah Zidkenu, uh, according to Jeremiah 33, 16. So Jehovah Shema and Jehovah Zitkenu. Ezekiel gives a, a short description of the millennial Jerusalem, but, but other scriptures mentions a bit more information. For instance, Psalm 48, uh, verses 1 to 13. Um, in verses 1 to 3, it describes the city as the residence of the God of Israel. Great is Jehovah and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, the city of the great king. Uh, and verse three says, God has made himself known in her palaces for a refuge. So that's verses one to three, it just tells us the residence of the God of Israel. In verse eight, it is God who will establish the city. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of Jehovah of hosts, in the city of God, God will establish it forever. So because God will dwell in and judge from Jerusalem, the city is now to rejoice. In verse 11, it says, let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. And then he goes on, the psalmist goes on in verses 12 to 13, the inhabitants are now encouraged to study the beauty that will characterize the city in the, that future day. Walk about Zion, go around about her, that you may tell it to the generations following, because it's a magnificent city. Now, because 
it is God who will establish Jerusalem, the city will be known as the city of God. And according to, uh, as this is according to Psalm 87, verses 1 to 7. Verse 1 says, his foundation is in the holy mountains. Jehovah loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. So here we see in, in Psalm 87, it's called the city of God. Now, with the reestablishment of the Davidic throne, peace is now going to characterize the millennial Jerusalem. We see that in uh, Psalm 122, verses 1 to 9. And here the psalmist is writing. He says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of Jehovah. Verse 5 says, for there are set thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. Peace be within your walls. For my brethren, companions sakes, I will now say peace be within you. So Psalm 122 uh, characterizes the peace that will be in the millennial Jerusalem. Now, going on to Psalm 147, verses 2 to 3. At the time of the regathering of Israel, Jerusalem is built. Jehovah does build up Jerusalem, it says. He gathered together the outcast of Israel. He heals the broken in heart and he binds up their wounds. Now, since it is God who is rebuilding Jerusalem, the city is going to be characterized by strength as well as peace. And this we find later on in Psalm 147. We find this in verses 12 to 14, where he says, Praise Jehovah, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates, and he also makes peace in your borders. What else do we see here? Well, we see it continuing in Psalm 147, verse 15, and, and verses 19 to 20. We see that the kingdom or the millennial law will emanate from here. Verse 15 tells us of Psalm 147. He sends out his commandment upon earth. His word runs very swiftly. This kingdom law we also see in verses 19 to 20 of Psalm 147. It says he shows his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his ordinances unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any nation. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, he gives us a little bit more insight into the millennial city. Um, and it's characterized by Isaiah, by holiness, justice, and righteousness. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as, as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, a faithful town. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her converts with righteousness. Later on, Isaiah says in Isaiah 4, 3 to 6, he says, he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. So holiness will characterize the establishment of Jerusalem. For all her previous sins will now be purged by God's justice and refining fire. Because it says in verse 4, the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. That's all their sins. Over the entire Mount Zion will be the visible form of the Shekinah glory, because what they're going to do is they're going to see a cloud and smoke by day, which is what they had leading them out of the, out of Exodus, out of Egypt, and we're going to have a shining of a flame fire by night, for over all the glory should be spread a covering. So what we see here is we see the Shekinah glory in 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 his form of of cloud, fire, smoke. Now, according to Isaiah 14, verse 32, Jerusalem is going to serve as the place of security for the afflicted people. Jehovah has founded Zion, and in her shall the afflicted of his people take refuge. Later on in Isaiah, Isaiah 33, verses 20 to 24, he describes the millennial Jerusalem as follows. Your eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tent that shall not be removed. So what we see here is quietness and security is going to characterize Jerusalem in that day. 
but there Jehovah will be with us in majesty. So what he's saying is that Jehovah in the person of the Messiah will dwell in this city. That's verse 21. It will be a city of many streams and waters. But he goes on to say that there'll be no galley. That's a, you know, one of those fighting, fighting ships. No galley with oars. Neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. So what we see is that it's going to be a city with waters around it. But it is without any ships of war ever sailing in them. Jehovah is our judge. Jehovah is our lawgiver. Jehovah is our king. He will save us. And this is in the city. Why? Because the Messiah who is ruling and running in the city, he will be the judge, the lawgiver, the king, and he is the savior. And so Israel's sins will be totally forgiven. And the holiness and freedom of Jerusalem is emphasized again by Isaiah in Isaiah 52 verses 1 to 2. Verse 1 says, put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. And verse 2 goes on to say, shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit on your throne, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So in that day, Jerusalem will become the holy city and nothing unholy will ever enter into it. He goes on to say in verse one, he says, in that day, in, this is uh, 52, there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. It will be further characterized by freedom. For the times of the Gentiles will be no more and never again will Jerusalem be subject to bondage. That's in verse two. In verses seven to 10, there's some good news that's going to be declared. How beautiful, verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains of the feet of him that brings good tidings, that says unto Zion, your God reigns. So the good news for Jerusalem is that Messiah will reign in Zion. And the Jews will be regathered to its capital in verse 8. And it says, they shall see eye to eye when, Je when uh, Jehovah returns to Zion. Jerusalem will be built all over again, for God will redeem the city, for Jehovah has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Salvation will characterize Jerusalem. Verse 10 says, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. That's where we will be. Jerusalem is to become the center of worldwide Gentile attention, according to Isaiah 60, verses 10 to 14. Isaiah 60, 10 to 14. Now, the Gentiles, who will be the servants of Israel, will also be used in building up the millennial Jerusalem. Verse 10 says, foreigners shall build up your walls. Now, remember the 12 gates that were named after the 12 sons of Jacob? Those gates shall be open continually. They shall never be shut by day nor night. So right throughout the kingdom period, these gates will be opened. The Gentile nations and their kings shall minister unto you. What does that mean? It means that they're going to bring tribute unto Messiah through these gates. Now, failure to do this will bring swift judgment. For that nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Yes, those, those nations shall be utterly wasted. That's verse 12. Now, the Gentile nations who in the past afflicted the city of Jerusalem will now bow down in submission to its authority. All they that, this is verse uh, 13 to 14, all they that despised you shall bow themselves down at the soles of your feet. You know, with a, a very detailed description in, in verses uh, 1 to 12 of chapter 62. Not that we're going to go through them all, but we, it's there if you want it. The millennial city of Jerusalem will be characterized by brightness and righteousness. And uh, this is Isaiah's, this was Isaiah's prayer here. He, he, he's, he's praying, he says, for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. 
And in verse 2, it says that all the nations of the earth shall see your righteousness. At that time, you shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of Jehovah shall name. Now, that's the one mentioned in Ezekiel 48, 35, which was Jehovah Shema. And the city, you shall also be a crown of beauty in the hand of Jehovah and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. She will never again, Jerusalem will never, ever again be forsaken or desolated by God. Verse 4 tells us this. You shall no more be termed forsaken, neither shall your land any more be termed desolate. Instead, verse, the second part of verse 4 tells us, but you shall be called Hebzibah and your land Beulah. For she'll be God's joy and delight. She says, the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Now, to make sure that these promises will be fulfilled, it goes on to say that I have set watchmen, which are uh, angelic messengers, have been placed upon the walls of Jerusalem. They are there today. They shall never hold their peace day nor night. So their entire ministry consists of reminding God of his promises till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth, to make Jerusalem the joy and praise of the whole earth. That's in verses 6 to 7 of Isaiah 62. Now the inhabitants of millennial Jerusalem are promised that they will enjoy the fruit of their labors, for the results of their work will never again be taken away by their enemies enemies so we that's in verses eight and nine so what we see here is uh, there's a declaration is made that the redemption and salvation of jerusalem is guaranteed it's assured jerusalem has proclaimed even unto the end of the earth say ye to the daughter of zion behold your salvation comes now why is it assured it is assured because god is the one who keeps his promises in verses 10 to 12 Now, joy and rejoicing will be prominent characteristics of the millennial Jerusalem, according to Isaiah 65, 18 to 19. Boy, you'd be a redeemed nation with your Messiah ruling from the throne. You'd want to be rejoicing and joyful. Behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. That's Jehovah talking. That's Jehovah. Peace and comfort along with joy are features of the city in Isaiah 66, verses 10 to 14. For thus says Jehovah, behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. Verse 13 says, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And you shall see it, and your heart shall rejoice. Now, <clears throat> Isaiah is the primary prophet, primary major prophet, that is, describing the millennial Jerusalem. But others like Jeremiah also spoke a bit about it as well. Because we see in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, verse 17, we see the reestablished Davidic throne will be in Jerusalem, and that will make it the center of Gentile attention. Verse 17 says of Jeremiah 3, at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of Jehovah and all the nations shall be gathered onto it. So all the Gentile nations will gather into Jerusalem. It's also going to be a center of Jewish attraction according to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 verse 6. For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the hills of Ephraim, which is, which is, which is north of, of, uh, of, uh, of Jerusalem, shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion, unto Jehovah our God. We see that the increased size of, Je of uh, Jerusalem, its holiness, and its indestructibility are the points of Jeremiah 31, 38 to 40. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, the city shall be built to Jehovah from the tower of Hananel unto the gate of the corner. It shall be holy unto Jehovah. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down anymore forever. 
So, holy unto Jehovah. The peace and joy that will return to Jerusalem is described by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33, verses 9 to 11. Now, this joy, peace, and glory of Jerusalem is going to attract the Gentile nations from afar. It says in verse 9, it says, for a praise and for a glory before all the nations of the earth. That's all the Gentile nations. All the former desolations of Jerusalem will be forever forgotten in verse 10. For the streets of the city will now bustle with the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride in verse 11. Now, scattered amongst the minor prophets are some more references regarding or describing the millennial Jerusalem and this city, uh, Joel 3.17, this city is to be characterized by holiness and security only because God himself will dwell in her according to Joel in Joel 3.17. So shall you know that I am Jehovah your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no stranger pass through her anymore. Micah, uh, Micah 4, 6 to 8 tells us that it is from Jerusalem that God will reign over the regathered Israel. In that day, Verse 6, he goes on to say in verse 7, I will gather that which is driven away and that which I have afflicted. And I'll make that which was lame a remnant and that which was cast far off a strong nation. And Jehovah will reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. In Zephaniah, Zephaniah, Zephaniah 3, 14 to 17, he gives us the description here. Jerusalem, he says, is to shout for joy and gladness. Verse 14, for the city will be redeemed. Jehovah has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. So what we see is that God himself will dwell in the city. He says the king of Israel, even Jehovah, is in the midst of you. Verses 15 to 17, and reign over, he's going to reign over her inhabitants. And he, was, he is going to rest in his love. He will joy over you with singing. That is, that is a Jehovah joying over Israel with singing. Now, Zechariah, not Zephaniah, but Zechariah, one of the minor prophets, had the most things to say concerning millennial Jerusalem. In the very first chapter of, of his book, in, in Zechariah chapter 1, verses 14 to 17, the prophet reported... A, a promise God made. He has, God has every intention of choosing Jerusalem in spite of desolations afflicted on her by the Gentiles. In verse 14, we read, cry you saying, thus says Jehovah of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Verse 16 goes on, therefore, thus says Jehovah, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says Jehovah of hosts. Verse 17 goes on to say, and Jehovah shall yet comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. In Zechariah 2, 1 to 5, the prophet builds up some more on what he says in verses 14 to 17 of chapter 1, in which, which we read that God will says he will choose Jerusalem and rebuild her. Now, Jerusalem will indeed be rebuilt, but it's going to have to be built to a size far greater than ever before. The rebuilt city is portrayed as a town without walls. Jerusalem, shall, this, is, uh, this is verses 1 and 2 of Zechariah, uh, Zechariah 2. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls by reason of the multitude of men and cattle therein. Now, it doesn't state here that there will be no walls. It just says, it says, as without walls. Now, the purpose of enclosing cities with walls was for protection and security. But the millennial Jerusalem will not need a wall for the purpose of protection or security. Rather, what we see here is the purpose of Jerusalem's wall will be for beauty. It's something to look at. Jerusalem is going to be so large because there's such a multitude of men and cattle therein. There are two reasons we find why the wall will not be needed for security. Well, the first one we should know because God himself is going to dwell in the midst of her. 
midst of Jerusalem in the person of Jesus the Messiah. And second, we find that the Shekinah glory will surround the city in the form of fire in verse 5. For I say, says Jehovah, for I, says Jehovah, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. Same point is recited in Zechariah 2, 10 to 12. God in the person of Messiah will indeed dwell in Jerusalem. For lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of you, says Jehovah. And for this very reason, many nations shall join themselves to Jehovah in that day. Jerusalem is going to become the center of worldwide Gentile attention in verse 11. And from his throne in Jerusalem, the Messiah will reign over all Israel and the Holy Land. We see that in verse 12. Now, another description of millennial Jerusalem we find in Zechariah 8. Remember, we said he, he, he speaks a lot about this. Zechariah 8, verses 1 to 8. Now, God's special jealousy for Jerusalem. He says, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy. And that's going to cause him to return to the city to dwell in her midst. I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. That's verse 3. Now, at that time, she'll become the city of truth. And that will be upon the mountain of Jehovah's house. We see that in verse 3. The city is going to be inhabited by the very young and the very old. And that's in verses 4 to 5. The very young will be those who will be born in the kingdom, while the very old will indeed be very old because many will be several hundred years of age in the closing centuries of the millennium. Because remember, it goes for a thousand years. When you enter in, if you're entering at age 40, you're going to end up finishing at age 1,040. The millennial Jerusalem will be a marvelous work that only God can do. Should it also be marvelous in my eyes, says Jehovah of hosts. Once the city is established, she'll be inhabited by the Jews regathered from all over the world, according to verses 7 and 8 of Zechariah 8. Zechariah 8, 20 to 22 now points out that, it, that uh, Jerusalem becomes a center of worldwide Gentile attention. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples. Now that's Gentiles. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Jehovah. Now this is, this is Messiah sitting upon the throne. Unique situation of, Zechariah, of uh, Jerusalem in the kingdom is also described by Zechariah 14, 9 to 11. Where Zechariah writes, he says, Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall Jehovah be one and his name one. All the land shall be made like the Arabah from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. She shall be lifted up and shall dwell in her place from Benjamin's gate onto the place of the first gate onto the corner gate. From the tower of Hananel onto the king's wine presses. And men shall dwell therein, and there shall be no more curses, but Jerusalem shall dwell safely. So Messiah will be king in the city. Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. That's Messiah. And the geography of the land will be greatly altered so that Jerusalem can be enlarged and exalted on the mountain of Jehovah's house. Only then will Jerusalem become truly the city of peace and live in total security. Man shall dwell therein, and there shall be no more curses, but Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Finally, the holiness that will characterize Jerusalem will extend to the very bells upon the horses and to the pots and pans in the kitchens, according to Zechariah 14, 20 to 21. In that day, there shall there be upon the bells of the horses holy unto Jehovah. In 21, yes, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holy unto Jehovah of hosts. And that is the golden age of Jerusalem, which is yet to come, but it will come. Now, 
some general characteristics of the Gentiles in the Messianic kingdom. Uh, these are the Gentiles who survived the judgment of the Gentiles for their treatment of Israel. These are the ones who are going to enter in and populate the Gentile nations in the millennium. Remember, these are the sheep Gentiles who, because of their faith shown by their pro-Semitism, these Gentiles are going to be able to participate in and populate the kingdom. Now, we, we, we covered a lot of this before uh, relating to the government, the church in Israel. But in this section, we're going to um, look exclusively with the place of the Gentiles in the kingdom uh, as a good number of passages, which we're going to see in the major and minor prophets will speak about this. Now, of the major prophets, Isaiah is the key text. In Isaiah 11, verse 10, the Messiah will be the center of Gentile attraction. It should come to pass in that day that the root of Jesse, that stands for an ensign of the peoples, unto him shall the nations seek, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now, according to Isaiah 14, verses 1 to 2, quoted, which we've already quoted twice in the, so far, the Gentiles will be the servants of the people of Israel. While on one hand they'll be subject to King Messiah, they'll also receive justice from him. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So these are some general characteristics. Now, at that time, in a special way, Messiah will become the light to the Gentiles, according to Isaiah 49, verses 5 to 7. The calling of the Messiah is not only on behalf of Israel to regather the scattered nation. It's not only to bring Jacob again to him and that Israel be gathered onto him. But I will also give you for a light to the Gentiles that you may be my salvation onto the end of the earth. So that's in verse 6 of uh, uh, Isaiah 49. So at the time of the final regathering of Israel, the Messiah will be manifested in the most complete sense as the light to the Gentiles. And kings shall see and arise, princes and they shall worship. All the kings of the nations will worship him in verse 7. Uh, Isaiah gives some more detail here in Isaiah 56 verses 1 to 8. At the time when the kingdom is set up, there may be some feeling among the sheep Gentiles that because of the exalted position of Israel, they'll feel excluded from receiving the benefits of millennial temple worship. But that's not so, because verse 3 tells us, neither let the foreigner that has joined himself to Jehovah speak, saying, Jehovah will surely separate me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. This is not going to be the case, for the temple ministry will be open to all Gentiles who are rightly related to the king. Under no circumstances will they be excluded, either because they are Gentiles or because they have been mutilated, the eunuchs, for instance. It is then and only then that the temple will be called truly a house of prayer for all nations. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, this is the Gentiles and eunuchs, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. When will that be? That will be at the time of Israel's final regathering. But the Gentiles are to have a place in the millennial temple worship is also taught in Isaiah 66, verses 18 to 24. The Shekinah glory, which will be especially manifested in the kingdom, will be seen by many of the Gentiles. I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. That's verse 18. And those who do see it will set off to travel among the Gentiles who neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. So they're going to go back out and uh, you know go and see the rest of the Gentiles and say, hey, you want to come and see the glory in Jerusalem. At the same time, Gentiles will be used to conduct the Jews back into the land of Israel. 
They shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for an oblation unto Jehovah. That's verse 20. And they'll be brought to the mountain of Jehovah's house in order to worship. So from among these Gentiles, and of them also will I take priests and for Levites. So what we see here is that God will choose some, some Gentiles to serve as priests in the temple. That's verse 21. Not only is Israel the eternal nation, but the faithful among the Gentiles will also be eternal. He says, so shall your seed and your name remain. This is talking about the Gentiles here. And they'll have a place. They'll have a place of worship in the temple for the Sabbath and new moon offerings. So the faithful among the Gentiles, they shall go forth and look upon the dead bodies of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. So their souls are going to be visible throughout the kingdom period, illustrating for 1,000 years God's grace to the faithful and his severity with the lost. Now, there is an obligation to observe the Feast of Tabernacles. And, of, and this is of the various feasts and celebrations uh, which Ezekiel talked about. This one feast, the, the Feast of Tabernacles, is obligatory for all in the, in the kingdom, for all the Gentile nations. Zechariah 14, 16 to 19 tells us this. He says, everyone that is left of all the nations, that, that's all the Gentile nations that, that, that will populate the kingdom, will be obligated to send a delegation to Jerusalem in order to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's verse 16. Now, it could be at this time that the Gentiles will pay their obligatory tribute to the king. Uh, and that, that comes out of uh, Isaiah 60, verse 11. Isaiah 60, verse 11. Now, though the Gentile observation of the feast will be mandatory, he goes on to say, Whoso of all the families of the earth goes not up unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, upon them there shall be no rain. Not every nation might be willing to obey. Why? Why, why would that be? We've got no idea. If at any time a nation should fail to send a delegation, the rains will be withheld from that nation for a whole year. Verse 17 tells us that. Now, as an example of the punishment, Zechariah mentions the case of Egypt in verses 18 to 19. Should Egypt fail to send a delegation, there'll be no rain for, the, for Egypt. Now, using Egypt as an illustration of a reluctant nation to keep the Feast of Tabernacles is quite significant because originally the feast was inaugurated as part of a memorial festival of the deliverance of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. Regardless of what nation may fail to obey this mandate, the punishment will be the same for all. No rain for a year. Another specific area the scriptures deal with is the Arab states. Now, the key charge the prophets bring against the various Arab states is their perpetual hatred of Israel. Now, this hatred that was to characterize the descendants of Ishmael and Esau began as early as Numbers 20, verses 14 to 21. Remember, Ishmael was the first a son of Abraham to Hagar, the Egyptian uh, slave. Now, this, uh, this hatred has continued throughout the biblical period and into it, right into modern history today. That is why there is still this hatred between the Arabs and the Jews. A passage that summarizes this attitude is Psalm 83, verses 1 to 8. Yeah. The psalmist begins by describing a conspiracy against Israel. He says, they take crafty counsel against your people. Now, he says, these are several tumultuous and crafty nations who unite together against the Jews. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So what their aim, these Arab nations, their aim is total annihilation of Israel, so the very name of Israel will no longer be remembered. Now, 
Remember President Nasser of Egypt? He was a former president or, or dictator of Egypt. He repeated this verse almost verbatim just prior to the Six Day War. The various nations consult together against, against you, God, do they make a covenant. And they unite in order to carry out the program of the previous verse, which is a total destruction and annihilation of Israel. Then in verses six to eight, the various nations are listed. Um, we have them here. We have the tents of Edom, which is southern Jordan, uh, and the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites, they're one of the fathers of all the Arabs. Then we had uh, Moab, which is central Jordan. We had the Hagarenes, which is Egypt. We have Gibal, which is Lebanon. Ammon, northern Jordan, Amalek, the Sinai Peninsula, Philistia, the Gaza Strip, Tyre, Lebanon, Assyria. That's primarily Iraq and parts of Syria. Now, these names are the, are the ancient ones, but they cover uh, the territory of the modern Arab states today. Uh, and this list shows what era they are comparable to today. Now, while such a conspiracy of the Arab nations has been present since 1948 and was more evident during, the six, during and after the Six-Day War, it is going to have its full force in the Great Tribulation. That's when we're going to, well, that's when it will be seen. Two other prophets pointed out the perpetual hatred against Israel, especially by Edom, which is southern Jordan, which we just saw. One of those is Ezekiel. He stated in Ezekiel 35, verses 1 to 5, he says, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. Now, Mount Seir is the long mountain range that overlooks Israel from the land of Edom. So it's to the, it's to the east of Israel. And this is where the descendants of Esau settled. Now, Ezekiel prophesies a judgment of God that will result in making Edom a desolation. I will stretch out my hand against you and I will make you a desolation and an astonishment. We find it in verses one to four. And verse five tells us, because you have a perpetual enmity and have given over the children of Israel to the power of the sword in the time of their calamity. Now, the background of this judgment is Edom's perpetual hatred against Israel. Remember, Edom comes out of Esau, which is Jacob's brother. And this, and this uh, perpetual hatred was, was even to the point that they were willing to turn uh, Jewish escapees over to the Babylonians, although Edom was also subjugated by Babylon. The book of Obadiah, uh, which, is, you know, which is only one chapter, it's, it's just verses, it also speaks of this hatred against Israel in verses 10 to 14. For the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried away his substance and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Going on to verse 14. And stand you not in the crossway to cut off those of his that escape and deliver not up those of his that remain in the day of distress. So, the sins of Edom described in these verses speak of another time preceding the Babylonian destruction when the Edomites committed very similar atrocities to those who were to commit on the Babylon. Once again, the reason for Edom's actions is their perpetual enmity towards the Jews. In determining the place of the Arab states in the kingdom, it should be viewed from the backdrop of their perpetual hatred against the Jews. Now, two principles will be used to determine the future of the individual Arab states. First up is the history of their anti-Semitism. And second is how closely they are related by blood to Israel. Ultimately, peace will come between Israel and the various Arab states, but it will come in one of three forms. It'll come by either mean, by means of occupation, by means of destruction, or by means of conversion. Now, as we go through the various Arab states, we're going to see how it's done. Lebanon. Peace will come between Lebanon and Israel by means of occupation. And this we find this from certain facts in the scriptures. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47, verse 13 to 48, verse 29. Remember, that gave us the boundaries of the nation of Israel in the millennium. 
The tracing of the northern boundary will show that Israel will encompass all modern day Lebanon. Modern day Lebanon is part of the promised land. So in the millennium, Israel will occupy and possess all of Lebanon, which will be settled by some of the northern Jewish tribes. Lebanon, as I said, was always part of the promised land, but it was part, it was the part of the land that Israel never possessed. Now in the Messianic Kingdom, it will be part of millennial Israel. So peace will come between Israel and Lebanon by means of occupation. Jordan. Modern Jordan comprises the ancient countries of Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Now, since God does not have the same future for each individual segment of Jordan, we need to split them into their three areas. Edom is southern Jordan. It is Edom or southern Jordan in particular that the prophets were concerned about. And several passages disclose that peace will come between Israel and southern Jordan by means of destruction. One of the passages is Ezekiel 35, verses 6 to 9. Here the picture is one of massive destruction. Blood shall pursue you. So what we see is that with blood and dead bodies filling the mountains, hills, and valleys, thus God says, thus will I make Mount Seir, an astonishment and a desolation. And I'll cut off from it him that passes through and him that returns. That's verses six to eight. The result here is that Edom will become a perpetual desolation. I will make you a perpetual desolation and your cities shall not be inhabited and you shall know that I am Jehovah. That's, that was verse nine of Ezekiel 35. Now, Jeremiah 49, 7 to 13, he gives a bit more here. The emphasis of Jeremiah is on the totality of the destruction of Eden so as to leave nothing remaining of the seed of Esau. Remember Esau, Jacob's brother. But I have made, e the verse 10 of uh, Jeremiah 49, but I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is destroyed and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Edom had been given an opportunity to trust in the Lord, but failed to respond. We find it in verse 11 of Jeremiah 49. So now the cup of iniquity is full, and Edom must drink of the cup of God's wrath in verse 12. This is the result. Bosra shall become an astonishment. Remember, Bosra is, is modern-day Petra southern Jordan. It's, Basra will, shall become an astonishment, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all the cities thereof shall be perpetual wastes. To all this, Jeremiah added in 49, 19 to 20. Once again, we have an emphasis here on the totality of the destruction. Surely they shall drag them away, even the little ones of the flock. Surely he shall make their habitation desolate over them. With the addition here that this final desolation of Edom will come by means of a war and an armed military conflict. This is what Jeremiah tells us. Obadiah, Obadiah, a little book, a book that centers its entire attention on Edom's destruction, tells us in verses five to nine. If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, how are you cut off? Would they not steal only till they had enough? If grape gatherers come to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? How are the things of Esau searched? How are his hidden treasures sought out? Obadiah also emphasizes the, total, the totality of the destruction here in verses five to six. He points out the failure of the Edomites to be aided either by their friends, the men that were at peace with you, have deceived you and prevailed against you, verse seven, or by their own wisdom or military might in verses eight to nine. Shall I not in that day, says Jehovah, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of the mount of, Seir, of Esau? And your mighty men, O Taman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone may, be, everyone may be cut off from the mount of Esau by slaughter. Later on in verses 17 to 21, Obadiah gives us some more info. The time of Israel's restoration, verse 17, will also be the time of Edom's final destruction. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Obadiah states rather clearly that this destruction will come by means of the children of Israel. 
Verse 18 says, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall burn among them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining to the house of Esau, for Jehovah has spoken it. The two houses of Israel will be like fire, while Edom will be like stubble that quickly catches fire when exposed to the flame. And the destruction, he says here, will be total, so that nothing will remain of Esau's descendants, while the descendants of his brother Jacob will own and possess the mountain of Edom. It's out of Mount Zion that judgment will fall on the nation. We see that in verse 21 of Obadiah. The fact that Israel will be used to bring about the final destruction of Edom is further portrayed in Ezekiel 25, 12 to 14. After declaring the sin of Edom, because that Edom has dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, which is verse 12, the prophet goes on to state that God will now stretch out his hand in judgment against Edom in order to destroy everything in it. I will stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Taman, even unto Dadan. Again, we see here the totality of the destruction is pointed out in verse 13, which will be by means of the people of Israel in armed military conflict, we see in verse 14. So Edom, or present-day southern Jordan, is to suffer desolation, and the annihilation of all descendants of Esau will come by means of the people of Israel. Only by destruction will peace come between Israel and southern Jordan. As with Lebanon, there will not be a nation called Edom in the Messianic kingdom. Moab, which is central Jordan, Israel's neighbor to the east and the other side of the Jordan is Moab, which correlates to present-day central Jordan. It's also going to suffer destruction, uh, Jeremiah 48, 1 to 46. But this destruction will not be total. Those who survive the terror of judgment will come to repentance, and a remnant of Moab will return, according to Jeremiah 48, 47. Yet will I bring back the captivity of Moab in the latter days, says Jehovah. Thus far is a judgment of Moab. So peace is going to come between Israel and central Jordan by means of partial destruction that will lead to the national salvation of Moab. So there's going to be a saved nation called Moab in the Messianic kingdom. Now we have Ammon, which is northern Jordan. Uh, this is modern, modern day northern Jordan, that is. It's also going to suffer partial destruction and become a possession of Israel. Uh, Jeremiah 49 uh, tells us this. Verses 1 to 2 tells us here. Of the children of Ammon, thus says Jehovah, has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Malcham possess Gad and his people dwell in the cities thereof? Therefore, behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that I will cause an alarm of war to be heard against Rabbah of the children of Ammon, and it shall become a desolate heap. And her daughters shall be burned with fire. Then shall Israel possess them that did possess him, says Jehovah. So here, as with, as with Moab, the judgment of Ammon will not result in total destruction. And those who survive will turn to the Lord. For a remnant of Ammon will also be found in the kingdom, according to Jeremiah 49.6. But afterward, I will bring back the captivity of the children of Ammon, says Jehovah. So... Peace comes between Israel and northern Jordan by means of a partial destruction followed by conversion. And there will be a saved nation called Ammon in the kingdom. So, just sum it all up. Peace will come between Israel and the three parts of Jordan by means of destruction, but not to all the same degree. In the case of Edom, southern Jordan, the destruction will be total. And there will not be a nation by this name in the kingdom. The Edomites are descendants of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. And so Israel and Edom were the closest blood relationship. In the cases of Moab, central Jordan, and Ammon, northern Jordan, destruction will be partial. There will be a Moab and an Ammon in the millennium, with both nations being subservient to Israel. Remember, Moab and Ammon. These are descendants of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. They are more distantly related by blood. 
So that's where we'll leave it for this session. And uh, thanks for coming along. And uh, there are contact details. Study hard and grow strong.